Welcome everybody. Fantastic to see so many people here. I hope everybody is safe and well. For those who um, who haven't met Gary before, um, stand up Gary and wave so that everyone sees who you are. Gary will be interacting during this evening's uh, seminar. Um, although you can't speak to us, you'll be able to communicate through the chat box. So the chat box, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen is the place to ask questions. Um, Gary will monitor the questions and we'll have a, a pause during the proceedings to um, cover anything important that comes up. So I assume you're able to interject there, Gary, if, uh, if you need to with any of those questions. Yep. Because I'm happy for you to butt in if, um, if need be. Um, and um, at the end, we'll have a, a more comprehensive uh, question session. Free to download that music, print it off if you need to, but it will be up on the screen. So let's get started. Um, we will look at the tune A Canny Glen. It's a 2 4 march, and the reason that it's been selected is because it's probably a reasonable grade three or, or lower end of grade three type march tune for competition. So many of the things that we'll need to discuss or look at will be in the tune. If we did something simpler, a straight beat, upbeat, up, down type four, four march or something like that, we wouldn't be covering many of the things that we should. If we looked at something more difficult, we'd probably be reaching beyond the capability of some of the people that will be on here. So we've selected a fairly simple march. It's a pretty tune. Um, and the intention is not to teach you how to play it, but the intention is to teach you how to analyse it and have a look at the things that we would be looking at as adjudicators going through the tune. And, of course... If we're looking at it as an adjudicator, then that's what the audience should be listening for, especially if they're an educated audience, because it's how musically to present a tune. So let's have a look, first of all, perhaps at some of the theory behind the tune. So the tune itself, which I'll just pull up, has some musical instructions on it. And you'll see my cursor going across the page. So here we go. Uh, if you can see my cursor, the first thing that you see in the middle of the top of the page, it says March. And it might seem silly, but that's actually the most important musical instruction on the page because that gives us an idea as to what we're actually playing, the idiom that it's going to be played in and to some extent the tempo as to which we would be expected to play it. So that's a, a fairly important musical instruction without which we'd have a lot of difficulty playing the tune. As we go through then, you see you've got your treble clef there, which is another musical instruction that tells us where the notes are. So if we were playing in the bass clef, we'd obviously be playing different notes on the same lines. So the treble clef is all important to us. Now, the reason that I mention it is because if we're doing one of the examinations which the association provides, of course, if you write a piece of music, it's important to have that there. If another musician looks at the page and it's not there, they've got no idea what they're actually doing. But to analyse tune, more importantly, the next musical instruction we have here is the time signature. So the time signature for this tune is 2-4 time, which tells us that we have using the upper figure, we have two beats in the bar. And the bottom figure tells us that we have quarter note values, crotchet value beats. So if you look at the tune itself, tunes are generally grouped, the notes are grouped into the values of the beats. So if you look at the first bar of the tune, you'll find that the first beat, which is a crotchet, 
is separate from the next grouped section of notes, which all equal the second crotchet in the bar. So the beats stand out as being very easy to follow. The Obviously, the intention of, of music is that it's straightforward, it's logical, and it's easy to read quickly. So that's why all of the beats are grouped together. If we... Um, take a look at this group of four notes. I'll just expand that so that we can look at the, the group itself. If we look at this group of four notes, because we're looking at two four time and the beats are crotchets, the beats are divisible by two. So we have a beat which is on the first note of that group. And then we have an upbeat, which is on this little B in the middle of the group. So there's a beat and an upbeat. So if we're looking at two, four time, we've got our beat, which will go through one, two, one, two. That's divided into one and two and one and two. And so that's our beat and upbeat. If we were looking at the same type of time, duple time, but in compound, we'd be looking at 6-8. So 6-8 has two beats in the bar, but it has six quaver pulses in a bar. So one, two, one, two, that forms our beats. But if we then divide it into the six quaver pulses, we're looking at one and two and one and two and two. And so it's a completely different rhythmical scenario than this, which is having your beats divided into two. So the beat and upbeat is all important to us when we go through this tune. When we listen to a tune, we expect to hear structure. So we want to hear the beat, we want to hear the upbeat, and we want to hear them in the right places. We then want to hear the tune played in pieces. It's like reading out a section of poetry. If you have no commas and no full stops, it doesn't make any sense. So with this, we're expecting to hear phrases, which in this tune are two bar phrases. And we're expecting to hear the ends of parts. So if we take a look at the tune, we have an anacrusis, which is here. So the anacrusis starts on the upbeat before the first beat. We go through for the first two bars and that's your first phrase. So we have a, almost a dividing line through the tune where you have a comma. So your first phrase would be... Okay, we move on to the second phrase. And that's where the phrase ends at the end of the E there. The next two notes are the introductory notes to the, to the third phrase. Which is a repeat of the first phrase. And then you have your, your final culminating phrase. Alright. So... Playing through that part, there should be a small division at the end of those phrases. So that it makes sense without just rambling on. The beat and the pulse, however, have to give you a constant rhythm. So any expression that we put into the tune has to be through extending the longer dotted notes, cutting the little cut notes, but keeping the rhythm constant so that we're not interrupting the flow of the tune. So we have to have musical progression always through the tune. Um, the accenting that we have in a, in a duple time tune, one with two beats per bar, is going to be strong, weak, 
or maybe even strong medium, depending on your interpretation of the difference between the strengths of beats. But obviously the left foot beat is the one which is dominant throughout the tune. Um, and we have to have some distinction between the beats to give the tune some colour and expression. Um, the ends of the phrases we're treating, the ends of the parts we're treating as though it's the end of a major phrase. So that's going to give us a, a, a strong ending and then we come into the anacrusis for the next part exactly on the upbeat. So if we have a look at the first part of this tune, oh, let's talk about the tempo before we have a look at that. The tempo of the tune, I think, will vary depending on who's playing the tune. So if we have a band playing the tune who are a reasonably low standard band, you would expect them to be playing the tune reasonably slow and carefully. If you were listening to a grade one band playing a tune such as this, you'd expect it to be bright and a lot of drive. So you wouldn't be expecting the same tempo from a grade four band as from a grade one band. And as you progressed up through the standards of the band, of course, you would expect the tempo to be increasing as the proficiency increases. And also, as the proficiency of the band increases, you would expect quite often that the expression that's being put into the tune will be a little more subtle. So, um, so your expectations of what you would expect from the tune will be a lot different depending on the standard of the soloist or the band or whoever it is that you're listening to. Um, technique, there's nothing particularly difficult in the tune. I think the major issues through this would be tecums. So the tecums appearing in the tune need to be presented cleanly and openly and with the correct procedure for playing a tecum. You know, if you're playing, you obviously want to hear the, the, um, the grace noting, but you want to hear the little short note played in the right place. And if you're putting it on a strong beat, there's a number of different ways of making a tecum stronger if it's placed on a strong beat. Um, you would either slightly open it up a little bit or play a stronger G grace note at the start. You'd agree with that, I would assume, Gary? I would uh, normally focus mostly on the length of the note. I use the term make that cut note more definite. It's yep. a way of thinking about it. But the, the stronger G grace note can also help. I'd be thinking about both if I could. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And then giving good weight to the note following. So one of the biggest problems in tunes like this, where you've got lots of cut notes which are coming through on the beat, is that all of those little cut notes quite often come ahead of the beat. So you find that the, the, the natural thing to do is to make the longer note, especially at the end of these tecums, the actual beat. So quite often you hear people playing the little cut notes far too early, which gives the tune a rushed feeling. If you wait for it and you play the tecums and the, and the reverse cut notes going upwards, if you wait for it and play them exactly on the beat, it makes the tune sound a lot more relaxed and you will have a lot more control through the tune. Um, so let's, um, uh, have we got any questions on any of that there, Gary? Is there anything that we need to address at this point? No, no questions so far. You must be doing a good job. No, 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 that's good. We'll, um, we'll progress on and start breaking up some of the tune and talking about some of the little, um, the little pieces involved. Could so I before you do go on, uh, Brett? Uh, what was that? Before we lose it, because you're about to do some of the stuff, uh, can I add a comment before you continue? Yes. It's a quick thing. Um, you'd mentioned earlier about the upbeats. Yes. And I don't think most people think about upbeats, and they are so fundamentally important in producing a well-expressed 2-4 um, march. Absolutely. Many bands will start tuning up with the green bills, which is similar sort of a musical structure, except three beats per bar. Inevitably, they get faster and faster and faster. 
And my opinion is more often than not, it's because they're not thinking and feeling the expression of the upbeats. Yeah. It's fundamentally important and we usually don't think about them. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll go through and show the upbeats and explain a lot more about them as we break up the tune. But to digress and, and, and preempt what we would be discussing in, um, in the next one where we're talking about stress bays and reels, I generally, in most reels, play to the upbeats. I play the upbeats uh, a lot stronger than I would the beats. Um, and I find that the way to express a lot of reels. Um, so the upbeats are all important. And, and one of the techniques that I use to practice marches and reels in particular is that I'll double tap the tune. So instead of playing da di da di dum do, I'd be playing da di da di dum do. And that's how I would practice a tune in the early stages. And it's certainly how I would practice a tune during the period of, of making it more proficient. But I won't do it every time. And I certainly won't do it whilst I'm performing a tune. So, and by performing it, I don't mean at an actual performance. By performing it, I mean actually up on my bagpipe, playing the tune at home. If I'm doing that, I'll generally be tapping beats. But if I'm sitting down, breaking a tune down, getting it accurate, I'll quite often double tap the tune and tap the beats and the upbeats. Um, it gives a lot more accuracy. And it certainly will stop you from running away and increasing tempo in the tune which we can discuss as we get to the, to the end parts of the tune. But anyhow, let's have a look at the, the first phrase of the tune. Um, I'll get us in a bit closer. Here we go. So the first phrase of the tune, we've got to look at ensuring that our beat falls on the right place to get accuracy in here. So a few people will obviously disagree with some of these interpretations of where it comes, but I would put the beat on the C grace note in the D throw. And aside from that, I would put the beat and the upbeat on the back end of all of the G grace notes. So if I have a doubling, my G grace note, I consider to be the beat. And as my grace note finger comes down on the chanter, my foot comes down and hits the floor. So when I hit the floor, my finger hits the chanter. Someone's stick should be hitting the drum, whether it's a bass drum or whether it's a side drum. As that hits the drum, obviously that's the beat. So as your stick hits the drum, your foot should be hitting the floor. As your G grace note finger hits the charter, your foot should be hitting the floor. And that's what holds the whole band together. So if we have a look at the first phrase here. We have an anacrusis that starts on an upbeat. We have a long D, which is a left foot, and it's a strong beat. So we give that as much value as we can, but we can't go beyond the next beat. So if we play the doubling too early, we're cutting into that strong beat. Now, we have a beat and an upbeat. We've got a beat on that E doubling. And then we have an upbeat that comes through on the G grace note that's on that little clipped D of B. When we have a look at that group, we have to hold the E at the start of that group and we have to hold the D at the end of the group. If we don't hold the D until the next beat comes, we're bringing in that next doubling on the B too early. The little note that falls on the upbeat, which is the B, is clipped. And so we cut up quite quick and hard from that. Whereas the D that precedes it, although it's written the same value, is a slightly longer note. So we open that so that we can play a clean B and cut up 
And if we played both of those exactly the same, you lose a lot of music out of that note group. If you can hear it, there's that slight weight on the D before you play that, that little cut B. And you'll find that with every note group in a, in a two, four march where there's four notes and there's two cut notes in the middle, every time there's one note which will get slightly more value than the second one. So when we move on to the next bar, we have the beat falling on the G grace note of the B doubling, and then the upbeat comes through on the E grace note, and then the bell. Right, so there's typical beat, upbeat, and then the next beat following. Ha dum do, ha dum do, ha dum do. All right, you can't break that because that's the rhythm. But you've got to come in at the right place and give the full value to the to the B at the start. So that makes the phrase. <laughs> If we move on to the next phrase, so we have again beat, upbeat, and a beat following. Before that, we've got all these little clip notes. All right. Now, all of those fall on a beat or an upbeat. So they've got to be precisely on the beat or the upbeat. We've got a high A at the end. And what I've been taught is that every time you see a high A in a tune, you give it absolute maximum value. So whenever you see a high A, you open your fingers up and you give it emphasis. So if we play... <coughs> and we ensure that we're giving full value to that high A, we can't run to the end of the line. Now, running to the end of the line is a, a notorious problem amongst early stage soloists and also low grade bands, All right? You even sometimes hear higher grade bands doing it. It's a bad habit. If you're thinking about the right notes, it won't happen. All right, so if we move on then to the next phrase, which you'll see starts with the anacrusis here, we then move on to the rest of that phrase. It's exactly the same as phrase one. So if we do our traditional phrase classification here, we've got phrase A, phrase B, phrase A again, and then we've got phrase C, which is the culminating phrase that finishes the part. So phrase A repeated. And then we have our end phrase coming through, which is going to finish the part. So we have a repeat of the bar above. We hold on to that high A and we've got our beat, upbeat and a following beat with the D strike on it. When we play that bar there, we're ensuring that we are absolutely rhythmically correct with the beat and the upbeat. We're holding slightly on the high A before because we always give full value to the high A. And again, it stops you running to the end of the part. And the tune's finishing on a D, which is our, which is our key note of the tune. Whereas up before, we're finishing on an E. So that doesn't sound like an end. Whereas this one is giving us a different sound, which finish, sounds like it's full stop. So we're playing a comma at the end of this one, and we're playing a full stop here. So that put together gives us our first part.
All right. Easy to follow, hopefully. Um, let's move on and take a look at the second part. So when we go through the second part, we have quite often you'll find in two four marches, you'll find that your phrase B, your second phrase in the second part, quite often mirrors the first one. Whereas it doesn't happen in this tune. This tune we've got new phrases. So the first phrase. <laughs> all right, if we have a look at that phrase in detail, we've got the anacrusis starting on the upbeat. We then move up and we've got a high A with a doubling on it. Now that high A, I would hold longer than the true value written in the music there. And I would cut the F very sharply. So that high A gives us our strong beat and it starts the part off with strength. Now, That's the second note group in that bar. I'm holding the start and I'm also giving a lot of value to that high A. All right, I'll open, I'll do that by lifting my fingers higher basically. So where I'm going through, the first high A is getting a lot of value. That second high A is actually getting a fair bit of value as well. The little clip note in the C following, which comes up to the, to the E, that little clip note has to start exactly on the beat. So we open this D up very slightly and wait until the beat comes along. Now, that's your upbeat on the D. There's your grip in there with the B grace note. For anyone who hasn't done one of those before. Now, is a repeat of bar one. Is a, that section there is a repeat of the first part, end, end phrase of the first line. All right, so we've got beat and upbeat happening. Hey, yonder, upbeat, dumba, hey. Is a repeat of the first phrase. And then we've got the culminating phrase from the first part. All right, so there's not a lot to learn in that second part. We're really learning two bars. The rest of it after that, we've already done. Um, learning the tune, I would always learn it in those two bar phrases. I want the two bar phrases stuck in my head. When I march to it, I march to a tune by the phrase pattern. So if I'm walking up and down the room, I walk four bars and turn for four bars, walk back for four bars and turn for four bars. So every time I step off, I'm stepping off at the start of a part, whether it be the first time through or the second time through the part. I'm always stepping off from turning at the start of the part. The phrases are stuck in my head because I'm doing it all by phrase structure. I can't go wrong and I can't play a part too many times because I know every time I'm down the same end of the room, I'm starting a new part, all right? Third part. <laughs> A 
again. So in there, we've got the same first bar and anacrusis as we have in the first part. Right. An interruption, please. Yes. Some people are asking if you could use your mouse a little bit more to show where you're working. Okay. Thanks. So we're up to the third part here. So as we start off, this first bar is exactly the same as the first bar in the first part. We then playing attack them and we're up to the D on the upbeat, which is virtually the same type of rhythmical structure as we're playing in the second part there. And you've got the same grip coming down to the low A. So we've got the D there, which is open and the very cut B, which comes up bang on the upbeat, comes up to the D. And then Tekken. So we have a Tekken upbeat on that, on that D doubling. Then you've got the next beat on your grip. Next phrase, which is this two bar phrase here. All right, so we have a D, which is a full beat. We come up to the F doubling on the beat. We then have the D with a G grace note, which is the upbeat. So when we're playing this note group here, we're doing a number of different things. First of all, we're giving the strong beat, the, the first beat in it some strength. The E is longer than the D. The D cuts up quickly to the high A. The E is the same as we were looking at here in this group here. The E has some weight on it. We then cut up with the D. And again, we've got a high A. So with the high A, we give that some value. We then come down onto the beat, upbeat, beat, upbeat. All right. So that phrase... Into the next one. All right, it's a repeat of the first phrase in that part. And then we have our culminating phrase, which we've done in every part so far. All right, giving that slight pause on the high A. So that covers us through the entire third part. So that should all fit together with the appropriate phrasing. And there you have the third part. If we move on to the last part, it starts to get busy. So the first phrase of the last part. So what we want to be doing through here is getting the strong beats through. So we have the first high A. We have that second beat, which is a weak beat coming through on the D. And then we've got a little clip beat, which comes through on that C in the second bar. We're giving good value to all these high A's, which are all dotted. We move through with the two beats in this bar being both clipped. And we give some value to that end note on the tecum, which is going to be the end of our phrase. Because we're going downwards and we're finishing on a tecum, that low A is going to be the end of the phrase. So the phrase is going to end exactly on the beat. So that phrase...
You can't finish it anywhere else. We move on to the next phrase. It finishes on the E. We then have an upward xenocrusis, which gives us our which is a repeat of the phrase above. And then we have our culminating phrase, but be careful because in our culminating phrase here, we have a low G at the end of the first tecum, whereas in all the other parts we've had a low A. So we have a cunning little change that comes through here and that becomes All right, it's sneaky. So if I fit that in with the phrases and the and the accenting through that part, Is that how you would play it there, Gary? Pretty much. The, the key things that I, I've been listening for and uh, thinking are important, certainly the high A's. That's yep. something I teach all my students too. Wherever you see a long high A, make it extra long. Yeah. When you think you've it too long, it's probably about right now. Yep. But certainly the, uh, the idea of making sure the um, cut beats and the cut up beats fall in the right place. Yep. That happens by holding things before that, not running off them too soon. Absolutely. I to focus a little more on the uh, the long note before it and treat the uh, the short note before it as incidental. But uh, you've got to hold something back. You've got to hold it back more than you think you have to hold it back to make sure that the beats and the upbeats fall where they should. When they do, they really <coughs> add an expression to the tune. Yep. Absolutely. And if you're giving appropriate value to the strong beats in particular, and you're opening up those high A's, that last part, which becomes quite busy, can't run away, which is very important. You know, once you start getting busy in parts, they either slow right down if you overexpress them, or they run away and become a complete shambles if you don't pay attention to the expression and phrasing through the part. So, um, um, you know, they're important. And these little motives where you have these two little short notes in the middle, like the, the second note group in the tune, they're all important. They create colour and music through the tunes. And you see them, you see them frequently through two, four marches and never are those two middle notes ever played the same. Very important. So have we got any questions through there, Gary? We've had one from uh, Matthew McNeil. I'll read it to make sure it's, it's clear. And I think it was focused on the second part. Yep. Uh, did you say that the beat should be on the grace note prior to the main note? Yes. The question is, won't this throw the timing out in the third bar where there is a note without a grace note? Um, I think that might be a, something to uh, have a chat about, Brett. Okay, so um, I'm just trying to have a look at what we've got. You say this is in the second part? We've got a beat with the grace note. So the grace note, the, the beat comes through at the back end of the grace note. So as your finger hits the charter, it's actually hitting the charter on the note. So the note itself is the start of the beat. The grace note is the grace note is coming down and hitting the chanter as the beat happens. So it shouldn't make a difference as to whether there's a grace note on there or not as to the expression of the tune. Yeah, I guess uh, from Does my that perspective, make sense? I, I could add to that, I think, Brett. I would say yep. whatever your hand movement is, your finger movement is, to get to that, um, what would appear to be the main beat note, whatever that finger movement is. Yep. The attack into the beat. Yep. Not usually, well, frequently, it's a G grace note because the G grace note's the strong one. Yes. But there's always some sort of finger movement to get to that beat. But that's an important thing to highlight as well is that your G grace note is the beat when you go through any tune because it's the strongest grace note of the chanter. And E and D grace notes quite often 
unless someone's trying to juggle around the expression with the tune, G and e, e and D grace notes are quite often passing notes or the ends of doublings. So, you know, with the doubling, your beat's falling on the first note, which is the middle note of the doubling. So the G grace note is coming down on the beat and the first note is the middle note of the doubling. It then has a second grace note, which divides the, the group in two. So you have a you have two Ds instead of one D, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that I, exp I explain that by saying you play the note and then you double it. Yeah, that's absolutely. What makes, that's what makes it doubling. And we do have another question too. Yep. Okay, Mike from Alabama has asked, can we please review the concept of cutting up again? Yep. And show it in the context of a note grouping. Yep, 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 yep. So, well, let's the concept of cutting up. So are we talking, yeah, okay. If we've got this second note group in the tune, so where we've got the two short notes in the middle, the first of those is like a leaning note and the second note will brightly cut upwards. If we then go and we have a look at the, the third bar of the tune, where we have our tecum, and then we've got all of these notes cutting upwards. The, the upbeat or the beat falls on the little cut notes. So they've got to be clean, but they're brightly cut up. So if we have a look at bar three there, they're, they're bright cut and the, and the, and the, um, grace notes are sharp and the notes are clean but cut upwards and it gives the tune bounce and life. Is that, is that the question that he was looking to ask? I'll wait for, for Mike to give me... Uh, yeah, let us know if that answers your question, Mike. I don't, want to, I don't yes. want to gloss over it and trivialise it. No, Mike is saying yes. Good. I have one more to want a comment and I agree with the comment. It's worth making now. Uh, Graham Hall has said, uh, I find myself singing the phrases really helps with getting the beat and upbeat as well as emphasizing, especially the high A's. My take on that too is a musician is singing through their instrument. So oh, singing okay. in your head when you're practicing and, and rehearsing music is a very, very good thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever I've got any student that struggles with the idiom of a tune, I get them to sing it. And the funny part about it is, I've got some students who are very good musicians and, and struggle a little bit playing pipes. And if you find that they're not getting the idiom of the tune, but you ask them to sing it, they've got it perfectly right in their mind. They can sing the idiom with no problems whatsoever. And in fact, sing it very, very well. It's just not quite cutting it on the fingers. So, um, um, you know, your hands will do what you want them to do eventually. But as a teacher, you want the students to understand the idiom first. Otherwise, they're working on something wrong if it's not correct. So, you know, singing a tune through is something that um, something that I do with students quite quite frequently. My singing's not uh, not particularly brilliant, mind you, but we'll um, we'll all have a crack at it. I'm no Pavarotti. <laughs> Far too many nods going on, on on my screen here. Yeah. Any other questions there, Gary? No other questions, but I've got a, a comment to add for, I think, a, a bit of discussion. We talked about the, uh, the final bar of a part. It's the end of a phrase. It's the full stop at the end of a phrase. Yep. I spend more of my time doing solo work than I do thinking about band work, so I have a little bit more freedom in what I can do. I always use my eighth bar of a part in a 2-4 march to hold back and get control of where I'm at. Yep. A band can do the same. If you time that properly, you give the downbeat and the upbeat their full value, their proper value, you time them to their full extent. That's a great place to get control of your uh, tempo and keep control of the expression further into the tune. It's a very good linch point. Oh, absolutely. And you know, the end of most two formats is... <laughs> You know, that 
that C doubling to low A with a burl on it is the end of 99.9% .9 of 2-4 marches. And in most cases, well, it, I can't think of an exemption. You, you actually open the C doubling and you virtually slow the tune down to play that bar. That's, play again control. And you won't do it in a band, but you'll always do it when you play solo. So, yeah, very good point there, Gary. Very good point. Now, we've gone slightly over time there, um, Chris. Are we... Um... I I think that's not a problem. Uh, if, if you're just looking at the time, we, we're a couple of minutes later getting underway. But uh, I think this is perhaps a good opportunity um, for any uh, recap that you, Brett, or Gary may have. <clears throat> and uh, also a good opportunity for... Uh, any more questions that uh, may may come out, um, bearing in mind that in a couple of days' time, um, we will have have this up on the cloud uh, to reference back to as well. Um, and I'm quite sure that both Brett and Gary will be pleased <clears throat> if there's any other questions uh, to um, provide some responses as well. We've certainly had some good feedback. We've just been congratulated by G.S. McLennan himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Very good. Well um, thank you very much for everybody attending and I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you, Gary. That was excellent to have your assistance through there. Uh, nice to see everybody here. would be nice to be able to chat to you all, but um, uh, obviously can't um, cover everything tonight and, and chat with everyone. The next piping seminar to come up will be Strasbase and Reels.